So the, our final speaker here is Thomas Melistas uh, from University of Georgia, who will talk about the largest scale geometry of over twisted contact forms. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about uh, the geometry of the space of over twisted contact forms. So the plan for the talk is the following. First, uh, the first portion of the talk will be about the main result, uh, which is uh, essentially a by ellipsis embedding theorem uh, for which we need uh, a metric, a distance from the space of the forms, uh, which I'm going to define. Uh, first, introducing, uh, motivating the definition of this metric. Uh, then I'm going to uh, say what properties of contact homology are needed uh, uh, to me. Uh, I'm not going to. Uh, but certain key properties are uh, useful. And then uh, I'm going to sketch the proof of this main result, of this by Lipschitz embedding theorem, by reminding you what is a large twist uh, by defining the embedding, and then I'm going to describe the calculations. So, uh, so first of all, the result uh, allows us to understand uh, the large scale geometry of the space of contact forms, supporting a given over twisted uh, contact structure uh, on a closed contact manifold Y. Um, so, uh, if we denote by H the lower half space in R2 with uh, the infinity metric coming from the sub form in R2, then the, the result is explicitly that there is existed by Lipschitz embedding theorem from uh, this part of R2 to the space of over twisted contact forms supporting a given over twisted structure H and Y with this contact Banach measured distance. Um, and for the more topologically minded people, I'm also including the definition. So if I have a um, uh, as uh, a matrix with the metric spaces, then uh, the dream is, of course, to find the isometry between the metric spaces. But if we cannot do that, then uh, we relax the conditions and we talk about the quasi isometry. So we say that the, uh, F is a quasi isometry if I have two uh, if I have three numbers, A, B, and C, uh, for which this first inequality holds, which means the, met the metric is not distorted uh, that much. And the second uh, condition, uh, which is quasi subjectivity, uh, means that uh, uh, we are subjective up to a, a constant. So uh, for this result, uh, what we are doing is we are uh, dropping the third quasi uh, the quasi subjectivity assumption, and a will be three and b will be zero. So we're going to show uh, an inequality of this form where uh, a uh, is three and b is zero, and we drop the second assumption. So. Uh, as I said, we need a distance on the space of contact forms, uh, which uh, basically the origins of that distance, the, the distance is inspired by the Banach measure distance between two convex bodies. In so uh, for the Banach measure distance between two convex bodies, what I can do is, uh, first of all, I want to interleave them in, in this uh, way. So I'm allowed to translate uh, my first body by a vector V, my second body by a vector W. And then I can act by GLN on my uh, this translated uh, convex body. And then I can uh, rescale uh, the, tra the translation of L uh, by some number A. And the optimal way to do that um, should give me the Banach measure distance. I, I just drew a suggested picture here, which is uh, L should be this green circle and K should be this uh, square. So. And uh, the, um, so uh, Ostrover and Polterovitz brought that to symplectic geometry uh, by proposing the symplectic Banach measure distance for uh, Liouville domains. Uh, and then Asser, Gut, Zhang, and Stoichavlevich developed this distance further. We're not going to talk about the symplectic Banach distance today. We are going to talk about the uh, uh, contact Banach measure distance. So note that when defining such a distance, I care about the ambient space where I work. Uh, and I care about the partial order with it, which gives me this interleaving. So the partial order here is containment. So uh, that's precisely what we want to do. Uh, find an ambient space and a partial order which will help us interleave forms and not bodies in this. And um, so the first definition is uh, what is a CS embedding. So a CS embedding of a strict contact manifold Y comma alpha. Well, strict, I mean, by strict, I mean I'm choosing the contact form um, so I, uh, if I have a CS embedding, I have a CS embedding of, of this manifold into the symplectization, we mean that we have an embedding which pulls back uh, the form theta plus some exact compact form in uh, symplectization to alpha. 
uh, what this means is really that uh, um, if eta is zero, that, that means that my embedding is transverse to the Neuville vector field coming from theta. Now, uh, the image is transverse, it is a uh, hypersurface which is transverse to the Neuville vector field, um, uh, which is locally modified. So you can imagine that I'm just relaxing the condition of uh, transversality. Uh, I'm allowing more uh, vector fields here. And that's um, like the, the point to, to this definition. Um, now we are going to define um, the um, uh, space W beta. So you, you have in mind, uh, you can have in mind like the simplification here. Uh, oops. Uh, so the simplification can be written as uh, a cone over uh, my manifold Y, uh, uh, where uh, the fiber of this cone is really. Uh, Uh, co-vectors, uh, which are non-zero. So I need co-vectors which are not zero, which have two properties. Well, the first property is that uh, the kernel uh, of beta uh, is really uh, uh, xi. So, uh, is that? so the kernel of beta uh, is xi. And the second thing is that um, uh, I, I care about theta being positive uh, on vectors uh, which are positively transverse to, to xi. So that's uh, uh, what we, uh, how we can think of this uh, cone of the simplification. And, le and then let me, uh, oops. So, okay. so then um, uh, if we define this W beta to be uh, like that, so we take covectors in the simplification, uh, which evaluate between zero and beta. Um, so and picture you can, a picture you have in mind about that is that if you uh, have your simplification and you uh, embed your, uh, and you have your form beta inside here as uh, embedded as its graph, then basically W beta is whatever is uh, below uh, the form. Then uh, uh, we define the form alpha to be less than the form beta if I have a CS embedding, which maps inside this W beta. So basically, uh, I need my embedding to be inside uh, below the graph of, of beta in the simplicization. So that's the thing. Uh, and then I can, uh, since I have the ambient space, which is the simplicization and the partial order, I can define the uh, Banach measure um, forms to be the optimal way to interleave them. So I need to find CS embeddings, uh, which uh, first map Y comma alpha to WC beta and map beta to WC alpha. And that is um, my way of interleaving the forms um, uh, alpha and beta. So you can imagine that that can be rewritten as one over C alpha, uh, less than beta, less than C alpha. So the um, uh, interleaving that. Now, uh, after having defined this distance, uh, I'm going to talk about um, contact homology and why contact homology is, is here. So contact homology is a homology theory with generators, polynomials, and good robotics. Uh, and the differential counts certain through the holomorphic series in the simplification. That was uh, rigorously uh, defined by uh, So the properties that we need is, uh, so first of all, this uh, homology theory is an invariant of the contact structure and not of the chosen form used to define it. So uh, that's uh, one thing. And the other thing is that it was shown by Meilin Yao in 04. Although there is an appendix in that paper by Eliasberg which suggests that, that, was not okay, that the contact homology of overtwisted contact structure vanishes. So that might not seem so good so far because, for, first of all, contact homology is an invariant of the structure, not of the form. And I can thing here is that it's always zero. So what kind of invariant is helpful to you if it's always zero? Uh, it appears that um, we cannot get uh, information from contact homology uh, about forms. But if we consider a filtration by the action of the rep orbits, uh, let's uh, that. let me. Uh, yes, there's some issue. Oh, with the maybe, maybe we can fix that. Let's see if that's uh, better now. No. But, no? no. So I, I guess. Um, 
Do you like, occasionally cover the microphones? Maybe I don't know. Uh, probably not. Maybe it's it's an issue with the internet. So I don't know. Is it still going off uh, and on and off? I think mostly it's okay. At, at least it's okay for me. I don't know if people. Okay, maybe I can uh, uh, try to talk slower. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so okay, so uh, let me know if that uh, happens again to the point that you cannot follow. So. Uh, uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, this contact homology is uh, an invariant of the contact structure, but we can get, get it to be an invariant of the contact form just by, um, just by considering a filtration by the action of rev orbits. Okay, and uh, this filtration uh, depends, uh, highly depends, it's very sensitive to the contact form. And whenever we have a filtered uh, homology, then we can view it as a persistent module and get uh, information from the barcode. Okay, that's, uh, that's the goal here. Now, the fact that, um, uh, that the contact homology vanishes implies that we have no infinite bars. So only finite bars can exist uh, in, in this, for this persistent module. Um, and the next ob observation picks the, the most uh, important bar which is uh, the bar corresponding to the identity of the algebra. So if I assume that the identity of the, of the algebra uh, is exact, namely have a primitive X, then for uh, a closed element uh, Y, uh, namely representing a class, I can prove that it's also exact. So that tells me that exactness of the identity is enough for the whole homology of but it also tells me that the bar corresponding to the identity is the largest one. And uh, that is because um, uh, if my element, uh, if my class is born at action level A of Y and dies at action level A of X plus A of Y, then A of X should be the, the uh, maximal length I can have. And because it seems like this uh, length of the largest finite bar is, is very um, powerful, we define this uh, to be the L invariant of the over twisted contact invariant of the form. Now, uh, to the expert, this seems familiar, like the largest finite bar in the case of Hamiltonian floor homology um, uh, was introduced by us in 2011, uh, and this is called the boundary depth in Hamiltonian. The L invariant of the forms is the analog to the um, 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 the boundary depth in this case. The question is, how can one control then the L invariant if one can control the L invariant? Uh, and the answer is uh, the dynamics of the large twist. So uh, I'm going to talk about the large twist later on. Uh, but uh, really, what uh, I'm doing here is. I'm using work by Chris Wendell, by uh, Wendell's uh, thesis essentially in section 3.1, where uh, he uh, works with the dynamics inside the large tube. Uh, and the second question one can ask is, is this modification Lipschitz? And in general, uh, experts expect this to be Lipschitz, where, yet we have to be uh, con um, uh, very careful here because we, we need to control volume and the L invariant simultaneously. So, um, and the computations here involve gray stability and compensating for changing the volume, basically. So let me just uh, talk about the, uh, the large twist here. Um, so uh, a way to obtain an over-twisted contact structure, uh, starting with a tight one, is to do the so-called large twist, which means find uh, a transverse knot in your manifold by a standard uh, neighborhood theorem. This, I think this is exactly 516 in Geiger's book, you can find the start uh, uh, neighborhood uh, for epsilon small enough around this transverse node for which the contact form looks like the kernel of uh, the contact structure looks like the kernel of this form right here. What you do is actually uh, you are replacing the contact form inside this tube by another form uh, which, uh, which looks like that, by the kernel of another form which looks like that. And it has the um, it has the, the these three properties. So um, I'm using the word full here because um, a full large twist does not change the homotopy type of your plane field, which by Eliasberg means that you are not really changing by the classification of over twisted contact forms uh, by Eliasberg in 1989. It means that you are not uh, changing um, the contact structure if you have um, a homotopic one in the uh, realm of uh, over twisted uh, contact structures. 
Now, uh, I have those properties. Maybe we can visually understand the path better in this way. So this is H1, H2, the path H1, H2 on the plane. And this is what our full lattice twist looks like. Now, for our, our construction is dynamical. And not only uh, the, contact, uh, for, uh, the contact structure needs to look like that, because what I want to do is I want to uh, carve out a solid cube and then uh, replace the solid cube by another solid cube, which has a different so in order to be able to glue at the boundary of this solid tube, uh, I need my form to really look like that at the boundary, which can be achieved by multiplying by a positive uh, function, which is compactly supported around this uh, T2. Now, um, uh, as we are going towards the end of the proof, uh, at the end of the talk, um, the first degree of freedom in R2, in this part of R2, uh, should be volume. And the volume of the contact form is defined by, by this uh, formula. Degree of freedom will be the L invariant. So the horizontal degree of freedom is volume. The vertical degree of freedom is the L invariant. This is the length of the largest finite bar. Uh, and uh, geometrically uh, speaking, the action of the lowest uh, action orbit bounding a unique pseudo-holomorphic plane in the symplectization. So that's how you can understand this. Now, um, uh, the volume and the L invariant are quantities associated to each contact form. So we have to modify. Uh, Uh, so you can imagine that if my volume is one and I want to have volume k, then I can multiply my form by square root of k and get the fact that I need this volume. The way to modify the L invariant is to perform a large twist around a sufficiently small neighborhood of any transverse node. Um, and the two notions are not independent, so we have to be really careful. Now, uh, the preliminary modification of the form would look like that. So. Um, I'm changing uh, the form inside the tube uh, to something that looks like that and playing with the first y intercept of this path, I can play with the L invariant basically. Um, and uh, like, uh, if my manifold is already over twisted, that means in some other part of my manifold, there might be a, a, a unique pseudo-holomorphic plane in this implication. So if my manifold is, let's say, algebraically over twisted, I cannot go up to infinity but I can make my L invariant uh, very small, essentially. So that's, that is what restricts me uh, with respect to the L invariant. Um, so what we need in order to have this embedding is a map mapping the point ln of square root of k and ln of L to a form alpha KL with volume being k and L invariant being L or something which is closely related to L. This map uh, is given by that formula. So this is my preliminary modification and I can arrange for my so I can make the volume k. Um, now, there is a way to modify the L invariant without impact of volume. So how do you do that? Uh, you just play with your second function inside this large tube and you, uh, but doing that has uh, an obvious effect. So what you need to do is uh, to compensate uh, for the volume without introducing low action orbits because um, uh, I'm, I really work with uh, uh, like the lowest action orbit here. So if I, in, if I change volume somewhere at some other point of my manifold without introducing low action orbit, that doesn't affect my, com my computation. So that's one, uh, one thing. Uh, but changing the volume changing, it changes the L invariant. And for the L invariant, we really have to use a triangle inequality in order to show the So. The left inequality, namely uh, in, in this by Lipschitz embedding uh, uh, theorem, uh, follows from this lemma, uh, which um, I mean, uh, the items two and four follow easily by just the the, we have, um, the formulas. Uh, one and three, the, the, like uh, part one, follows from the fact that a CS embedding is volume preserving and. Uh, like alpha being less than beta means that I really have a cobordism and I can use uh, between the two uh, um, embeddings and I can use uh, Stokes. And this part right here comes from the fact that um, uh, like filter code homology algebra um, uh, should, uh, like uh, when I have a cobordism between two, um, two uh, uh, forms in, in a sense, um, I have a, a map between filtered contact homology algebras. And uh, it, it, can, it cannot uh, really map, uh, th this algebra map cannot, uh, uh, cannot really map uh, 
zero to something which is not zero. So we are forced to have this inequality. So this proof goes by contradiction. Now, uh, so uh, just combining those uh, these these facts, the left inequality uh, follows from that. Now, for the right inequality in in this uh, case, uh, I need to use this triangle inequality. So if I go from the point K one and L. Uh, Uh, to the point ln of square root of k2 and ln of l2, then what I need to do, uh, I need to pass through that point. Why is that? Because if I want to change my volume from uh, k1 to k2, then I need to multiply by this. I need to rescale my dynamics essentially by this um, um, uh, number right here. Now, calculations using uh, Gray's uh, stability theorem show that this association is uh, uh, Lipschitz. And the explicit uh, inequality uh, looks um, like that. So I think, uh, yeah, that was. Um, thank you very much. This was a very complete. Also, we, we didn't catch the last sentence, but uh, let's thank the speaker first. And are there any questions? Yeah, actually, I have, I have some questions. Um, so first of all, thanks for the, for the nice talk. It was really, really interesting. Um, I just wonder, I mean, can you maybe, I mean, you've done everything for over twisted contact structures. Is there a way to modify or refine the L invariant, for example, to get something similar for tight contact structures? I mean, it seems to me that you've only used that the contact homology is zero. So that you know the the largest bar is finite, but you can still define the distance for contact forms, you know, for arbitrary contact forms. Yeah, uh, that's right, and that's a, like a very, like a very interesting question. The thing is that uh, at least in three dimensions, the gadget to modify this L invariant is the large twist, like this dynamical large twist, and I don't know a similar gadget for the tight case. Like I don't know how to modify this spectral invariant in, in the tight case. Um, so that's that's the main uh, obstruction, uh, uh, and I, I'm trying to think to think of that. Like, how do you control this? I mean, in principle, you could have you you, know, you have infinite bars, right? You know, something might persist in, in contact homology, but maybe you could I don't know. Maybe you could look at the largest finite bar if you have any at all. I mean, I don't know, it's just something very maybe yes. very naive, but uh, yes, I I agree with that. Yes, uh, the thing is. Um, so if I do that, that large twist, then I uh, uh, make my, so uh, the thing is that I'm given a contact structure and I play with the contact form supporting it. So uh, if I'm given a tight structure and I perform a large twist, then I have an over twisted structure. So mm -hmm. the, the gadget of large twist does not really work in, in that setting. So I need another gadget, which I don't know yet what it is in order to control like the, the finite uh, like the length of finite bar in, in some sense. And, and that's where, uh, yeah, this thing will start. But yeah, certainly this is a, like a very interesting uh, direction to, to, to think about. Yeah. I Thanks. guess I have kind of a comment to Augustine's question. Uh, if you can ask, at least you can do this for spheres, right? Because there's this kind of shortest revolvage when it's convex it does something special and you can take the spectral invariant for it. And it's also independent of volume. So you can probably also embed the R2 into it. So my question is, uh, what's the expectation? Like you, you embed R2 into it. Like, can you do like better than that? Like, oh, what's the expectation? Because naively thinking the contact form is kind of parameterized by, by positive functions, like roughly before you mod out any equivalences. But do you like expect embedding kind of the a space of like, post-function yeah. into it? Certainly the expectation. Uh, so what, what I think is that we miss, we, we miss a lot. Uh, like uh, what, what I'm essentially doing is I'm just picking a certain formula for my form. And then I, I'm playing with that formula. As you said, for contact structures, you can change the form by multiplying by a positive function. And then uh, that's the way to parameterize all forms supporting the, the structure. And this certainly seems like a very large space, like uh, not just R2. So the thing is uh, that, um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe 
the question can be like rigorously formulated in the sense what is the rank of uh, or like I think Sokhan talked about that in in, uh, in his talk that he defined that as the the rank or or the higher dimension R n you can embed into a space is called like the rank of quasi subjectivity or some something like that. Um, the answer, yeah, is I I don't know yet. Like I, I don't know how large that space is is expected to be. Uh, but uh, let's say if your manifold, contact manifold, is the space of co-oriented contact manifolds of a closed manifold, right? So mm -hmm. then you have uh, Riemannian matrix. You have contact forms responding to Riemannian matrix. Mm -hmm. And uh, often Riemannian matrix simply have kind of non-trivial uh, spectral invariance. So indeed, you have infinite rays. And uh, I think there was a work by... Jun Zhang and Vukashin Stasavlevich who were doing kind of something in this spirit, right? So mm -hmm. they were comparing uh, contact forms by looking at this kind of uh, sp spectral invariance corresponding to Riemannian metrics. And uh, there was uh, again quasi-isometric embedding on something very large. But they had a slightly different definition of the distance. So, so I mean, you have this CS condition and they had uh, so can you comment about this? Uh, no, in, uh, I haven't looked to, to that extent in, in that paper, so I, I have nothing like intelligent to, to say for, for that uh, uh, now. I will certainly look at that. We, uh, we've been talking with June a little bit on that, but not to like a... Like a an extent that I can understand, like the the work and uh, uh, work on that. But that's a, yeah, certainly a, um, uh, like I think that I should definitely think about like uh, like thinking how they play with these spectral invariants using the metrics on on the um, on the surface. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.